In the last video, I got the roof all buttoned up so that it no longer leaks. Now I need to move into the pole barn and basically install insulation. So it's just too hot in the summer and too cold in the winter to work in there. But there's another problem and that's the fact that the office smells terrible. There's so much stuff attached to the outside walls of this OSB box that you're looking at, but that box is the office inside of the larger pole barn here. And Inside there, it just smells bad. I don't know if it's mold and mildew or if it's cat pee or something like that, but uh, I really need to dig into the walls to investigate and find the source of that nasty smell. Which entails pulling this OSB sheeting that's everywhere, like inside and out. I need to pull it off. You guys can see the pink flume insulation back in there in the walls. So I need to pull that out you know that experience where you're cursing the last guy to work on the project that you're working on currently? The entire office is skinned inside and out with OSB, oriented strand board, with the label, the markings showing. This is good news. The, uh, the stamp here on the OSB says PS2. Now that's a voluntary, voluntary uh, safety standard, but um, it means that this is low formaldehyde emission coming off of this sheet or all the other sheets. So suitable for use interior. Plus it's been sitting and off gassing for a few years. So I'm pretty sure I can reuse this and not suffer any health consequences. Now I'm sure somebody watching this video is gonna chime in and say, that looks great. I love the look of raw OSB. And this was his idea of a nice finished room. The fasteners that he used are staples. You see that? That's a fastener, that's a fastener. So in order to get these sheets off, I'm having to sort of do surgery, pull a few of the staples out, which allows me to get a crowbar back and behind there, and then I can pull the whole sheet off. These are the sheets that I've already pulled off, and you can see all of the staples. But his biggest sin by far is these stupid drain pipes. Now, these don't go anywhere. They just pop out the outside there. And these two three inch pipes are connected. So was he gonna put two toilets here? Or was that gonna be a urinal? Maybe he intended that to be a urinal and that was a toilet and that over there was a sink. So that drains, comes into here and these two are connected. The reason that I know that he really messed up and he didn't even like what he did is because he built this extra wall, losing all of that uh, square footage here in this room uh, just because he didn't wanna deal with those pipes when he was framing. See, there's the pipe. It's just below the slab. It's not 24 inches down in the dirt where it's supposed to be, down there below the frost line. This plywood right here, you can see it's attached with construction adhesive to the two x four frame. And that is the last screw attaching this bench to the wall. And it was attached in a downward angle before the plywood was installed. And this is the aftermath, trying to get that off. And the screw is still in the wall over there. It was also glued with the overage from the construction adhesive to the wall. So the panels here weren't too bad to remove. You saw that. I was able to sort of zipper them one after the other. And getting the first one off was the challenge, but after that, it was pretty easy. This wall is not gonna be that way. So there's just no gap to get my uh, crowbar in. See, I can't even get it in underneath to start it um, from under there. And there's a seam right here, so I might have to do something destructive, but there's not always a seam. This board doesn't have a seam. I love this hammer. It's a Daluge titanium version of the Douglas hammer that I used when I was in my 20s and worked for a stint as a professional framer. And now I can get to the next board right there. And on this one, I started at the top corner and I'm using my other framing hammer so I can just walk myself right on down the line like this. This hammer has a straighter claw with a sharp chisel point to the claw, whereas the typical framing hammer here has a fairly straight claw still, but it's just not as sharp. And it's also a lot heavier than this one. So this one's easier to swing, but I did spend like $125 on this. And this was a few years back when I bought it, painted it red. And this one I only spent 30 bucks on a few years back. The OSB has been removed from all of the walls. I've even removed the framing 
for that wall. Still need to remove the framing for this wall here. That's going to go. But now I have to move on to the tough job of removing the OSB from the ceiling. But remember on the walls he used these staples to attach the OSB. But that's not the case on the ceiling where he used nail gun nails that have a glue on the nail. So as it gets driven home it like activates the glue and they are less likely to pull out than a 16 year old at prom. Well this is not going well. I can't tell the difference by ear of the sheet tearing like that or just tearing through the nail holes. I got it down. So why am I removing these sheets from the ceiling if it's such a pain in the butt? Well, there's a few reasons. First of all, uh, these sheets are going for $35 a piece currently, and I do have a very good use for them planned. Even in that condition, they'll still work just fine. The second reason is because I need to investigate what's in the ceiling. Like, you see all the mouse poop? So the mice even got into it way over here on this corner, which is strange because I don't see any other signs of mice, just sort of in this corner all isolated over here. And the third reason is because I don't like the wiring job that was done previously. I need to rewire the office for my needs. One technique that I'm using to get the sheets down is to pre-drill holes around some of the stubborn nails. There's one. There's another one. There's one. And in order to do that, I've got this cheap Chinese hole saw. You can see I had to cut a groove in it to help clear the shavings as I'm cutting. But this hole saw can't have a pilot bit because I need the pilot bit to be right where the nail would be. So if I try to drill a hole here, you can see that the bit wanders around. In order to keep it from moving, I've got this pilot hole drilled in a scrap, locating this over the nail hole. Then I'm holding my forearm like this so I can get enough pressure on it so that I can start the hole without it wandering on me. It's a pain, but it works. You can see it leaves those little sort of round plugs like that. And there's the dead mouse. I found him by stepping on him because of course he died in the ceiling. But how did he get up there? Well, you see that grate? There was another one of those down here at the floor inside of the office. So he crawled in through the grate. Then he American Ninja warrior his way up the corner here. There was a, um, there was a cord and then he crawled in through that hole right there and just in time to die up in the ceiling. Before I can hang drywall on the ceiling, I'm going to need to remove all the nails that are still left in the studs. And that happens sometimes where the nail head rips off and leaves the uh, the shank still in the stud. Japanese nail puller to the rescue once again. You just hammer it onto the shank and then go sideways before going back. There you go. On this wall, there's a lot of prep to do. I've got to wash all of the mold and the cobwebs off of the metal siding from the inside here. And then you can see just the nastiness that is the like mouse or rat nest or whatever this was. And this is old insulation that's like stuck to the concrete. Now, I don't know if it was a water leak that caused this to sort of glue down to the concrete or if that's mouse piss, but it sure does stink in this uh, room, even, even with all the uh, OSB torn off. So I suspect that's just a bunch of mouse poop and pee still left behind. So I got to clean up that biohazard and scrub the walls. Over here, you can see that at some point in time in the last 50 years, there was dirt that had built up on the outside of the pole barn and it had rusted through the siding right there at the base, only at the base, nowhere else. So to fix this problem, I'm going to use some of that roofing material that I pulled down from up there and I'm going to cut it to length to where it will uh, bridge the distance between this girt and the floor girt. And this is what that rust hole looks like from the outside. You can see they just painted right over it. What happened here is the dirt was up to there and that allowed water to wick in between the sill plate and the, uh, and the metal siding. And that wicked water stayed there in the interstitial space and it just rotted away the metal, even through the paint. And as long as that water can sit there for long enough, it will eventually get underneath that paint and, and rot things out. So if I put a new piece of siding back behind there, I'm just creating the exact same environment that caused this problem in the first place. Digging back the riprap here so that I can get to the nails, I'm seeing a problem. All these pine needles uh, are burying themselves in and amongst the rock and they're being held up against the, um, the board here, the sill plate, which is um, pressure treated, but you know, pressure treating isn't perfect. It doesn't make it like 100% rot proof. It just sort of delays. So this is not a good long-term situation. And with the trees on this side of the barn being deciduous trees, where are those pine needles coming from? They're coming from that tree right there, which is pine tree and it's dropping needles onto the roof 
which are then falling off the roof into the riprap. Also, this tree is kind of close to the pole barn, so that means that branches could fall off and damage the roof, or in a bad storm, the whole tree could even fall onto the pole barn and really damage things. So it does provide the benefit of um, shade, so keep it cool in there. But now that I'm insulating the pole barn, uh, that shade is not as critical, so I'm gonna have to seriously consider um, deleting or you know cutting that thing down. So that's where the rust ends, and down here, there's no rust on the siding, but I just peeled this rock back, and this is an ant's nest right in here. Pulling the riprap rock away from the ant colony there, we see a uh, quite a substantial underhang there. And I'm also looking at this concrete that they put on this corner, and I'm looking at the level of the ground, and this tells me that the ground in this area is settling. It's just sort of falling, and that slab, the concrete slab in there, is um, cantilevered. It's just hanging out in space with nothing underneath it. I mean, I guess here there might be something underneath it, but uh, at least the posts are deep enough that they're not settling. So the barn itself is straight. There's no, it's not bent or whatever, but this board here is, um, it's not really structural. The last major purpose that it served was concrete formwork, and its original purpose was just to sort of seal the barn from the outside. This is uh, because there was no slab, it was a dirt floor in there. This is what kept the elements out down here at the bottom. So I can stick my arm under there all the way to my elbow and I can keep going. You guys can see the plastic that they poured the concrete on top of. Right about here is where I was sticking my arm underneath the concrete slab. So now that we know about that subduction, I don't know what to call that, but the, you know the, the lack of support under the slab here, it's no wonder that there's this big gap underneath the uh, the framed wall. See this whole wall is hanging from the uh, from the posts. And now that I know what I'm looking for, this crack in the concrete makes a lot of sense. That crack really isn't even too bad. I didn't even notice it before. So on this side of the crack, the laser level says three and five eighths. Down here in the corner at the bottom of the settling, it's about four and an eighth. So about a half inch of fall overall. Not great, but not the worst. The solution to this problem is to have those guys come in with the foam pumping truck. They have this wand they can stick in there, they pump the foam way underneath and it expands and it lifts the slab up back into its original position. I'm not even going to touch the sill plate, that'll have to stay until the pole barn gets recited. How great is this? With the hole cut on the wall, I can put the power washer out there in the lawn so it can spray all the water at once and just the wand will come in here and I'll be able to blast the walls and all this nastiness and I won't have to scrub with a brush and it gives me lots of airflow to dry this room out in no time at all. I'm making these panels here and this one is the template so I'm aligning the screw holes. This way I have a line of screws that doesn't look terrible on the outside of the building. And yeah, I'm just tracing the template here, like so. And then it's requiring all of these tools to make it work. Uh, I've got my main metal cutting scissors and these ones, and then this fancy new tool that I use upside down like this. And it does the job across the flat section, but when I get to the ribs, that's when I need to use uh, these other tools. And then when I'm all done, I'm straightening it out with the Kinepex. So it's a task. There are certain activities a man can do to make himself feel quite powerful. I once held a 1500 year old katana in my hands. And of course there's always shooting firearms, but <laughs> holding two hammers, one in each hand, usefully feels awesome. And yeah, I do need two hammers because using just one pops the heads off the nails. Hey, I'm really getting good use out of my GMC motorhome. First it was a moving van and now it's a drywall rack. 
So I've kept the wall open the whole time that I've been doing this work on the ceiling. It's uh, been nice to have the fresh air to clear the dust out from moving all the insulation around and all that. Anyway, you can see over here in the corner, I've got the first sheet of drywall installed on the ceiling. Awesome. I'm finding all these voids in the drywall and it's been like 12 years since I did any drywall work. So, uh, you know, maybe things have changed, but I don't ever remember seeing any gaps in the drywall before, let alone as many as I'm coming across. So I'm just strongly suspicious that this drywall would meet QC because it has to be fire resistant for a half hour. Every half inch has to be fire resistant for a half hour. And with, with you know, much thinner moments of gypsum, like we're seeing here, uh, I think the fire would be able to break through at these weak points. Certainteed easy light from Lowe's. So, hmm, I'm suspicious. I wanted to be able to stop using the lights on the tripods just to make it easier to work in here, not be tripping over cords and whatnot. So I got the ceiling lighting working, even though, uh, you know, those ceiling panels haven't been mudded yet or anything like that. And I've still got all the other drywall to do. I've got some electrical work to do over here as well. And I was just now sweeping up just to get it all clean, make it easier to work. And look what I found in the corner. That is a turtle. <laughs> he wandered his way in through the uh, through the gap here in the wall. The gap, the gigantic hole. But that that's a thing to do. He he, he crawled up those rocks and he got his shell up and over that uh <laughs> that sill plate. So yeah, it's pretty crazy. Let's see if I can get him out of here. Uh, I've never held a wild turtle before. Come on out of here. Okay, you're gonna go hide in your shell. Good feel. Oh, he's hissing at me. Come on, dude. You're gonna do much better out here. Let's get that drywall dust off of you. Oh, his shell, the hinge there, closed him up. Got a little bit of some uh, some feet sticking out. That's it. He's not very vulnerable. I'm gonna go stick him over here. Got the wife mowing the lawn over here, and this is my pile of good insulation. This is a bad piece. We're gonna cut that rat's nest or mouse nest out of the insulation. There's my pile of all the rough stuff that I need to sort still. And there's my big old trash bag and all the pieces that are getting thrown away. So I could just toss all of this and buy some new stuff, but A, I don't wanna spend the money and B, I don't like being wasteful. So I'm gonna salvage what I can. Well, this is super interesting. We had company come over, so I had to take a four hour break from the project. And I left the carpenter square here on top of this piece of insulation in the sun. And you can see in four hours, just how much fading of the pink insulation happened. Really neat. And at some point, I guess a frog found his way into the wall and mummified and got partially eaten by insects. And isn't that interesting? All right, so this is the last piece, and I think it's a good illustration of what I've been doing. That's my cull pile. All those are going to the dump, and these are the pile of uh, what's good. That's, that's usable. So you can see this is a nest, and it goes up to, I don't know, like here-ish. So I would give myself a good margin and probably cut it about there and toss that. And this would have been the bottom uh, of the outside wall. So right there where the ribs um, are, you know, exposed and mice and frogs apparently can crawl up underneath the siding and get inside of the wall and that's why all of the nests usually happen at the bottom although the uh, the tops sometimes had a problem as well and in this case I see a little bit of um, digging damage right here it's not too bad but I would cut that off um, just the same like there's some more right there yeah that, that, that mice was a mouse was definitely oh yeah look at look at there's um uh, I would be digging that out and, and throwing it away. I just don't want any pheromones, any pea or any um, mouse turds to be in the insulation and attract more mice in the future. So I'm just using the clean stuff. So from about here to about there, <laughs> and that's what I'll keep. Now this piece is interesting as well because it's got a couple of uh, sort of defects that were caused by insects instead of mice. So there's one and there's another little borehole where some some insect of some sort decided to sort of dig down into the insulation, but I don't care about that. Insects don't leave stinky, disease-ridden stuff behind, so I can deal with that. That'll do. 
I found this rather large picture window for sale for $225, so let's go pick it up. Those are the rear seats that I removed from the back of the Lexus here so that I could fit this window in. And yeah, I just got back from driving about an hour southwest of here where I picked these up. They were listed on Facebook Marketplace or the window was listed on Facebook Marketplace. And yeah, you know, it's a 14 week wait if you order a custom picture frame window these days. So the, the COVID ongoing supply chain issues are uh, making things quite delayed. So beggars can't be choosers. This is a beautiful large window, a bit larger than I would like, but it will certainly do the job and the price was right and the availability today was right. So let's get this thing installed. All right, the window has been framed in. Now it's just time to reattach that siding and put the, you can see the pieces there. That's the patches, same as we did over here to eliminate the, uh, the rust holes along the sill plate. All right, the siding has been installed and cut and that is a very nice view. I need a piece of molding that starts right here on the two x four, goes out here and then bends down, a drip edge kind of a thing. And they sell that as a product, of course, but instead of making the half hour drive to the big box store, I think I'm just gonna manufacture one. I don't have a press brake that would normally be used to, uh, to make a 90 degree bend. So I think I'm just gonna use this rib, so this scored line basically, to get a nice straight bend. And that means I've got to cut from here to there basically, so I'll have those two flat sections. The piece has been cut. I've sort of improvised a press brake here with this two x four. I'm just sort of working my way up and down the, uh, the sheet here. Finishing it off with the rubber mallet here. That'll do to keep the weather out and the light in. I got these metal dish scrubbies and I found that I can unroll them. They just sort of pull out into this tube of um, knit metal strand. And once that's done, I can just sort of stretch them out and use the sheet metal shears here to cut a length of it off and stuff it down here in the hole where a mouse might be getting into the pole barn. And then I used some spray foam in a can to fill up the gaps like you're seeing here, but this is pretty soft stuff a mouse wouldn't have any problem uh, chewing through that, but not with the metal in there. So the metal is now embedded in the foam and they can chew through the foam for a minute, but when they get to the metal, I think that's gonna stop them in their tracks and we won't have any problems with critters inside of my walls. One, two, three walls and the ceiling are complete in the office here. The only thing left to do is that wall. So why isn't it done yet? The answer is easy because I can't finish that wall until I've got the main insulation installed in the larger pull bar. You see, I need to be able to access this space here. I need to be able to pull that insulation down from the gap here and make sure that it goes all the way to the floor. And I won't be able to do that if I've got drywall covering it. So that's the hang up. So tune in next time when I do the big tough job. How is one guy going to get uh, those massive rolls of insulation. So I can't even lift those things. I think they weigh 200 pounds and they're really large, so they're unwieldy as well as being heavy. Well, that's going to be a challenge. Tune in and find out how I solve that one. Thank you so much to my Patreon supporters. These are those guys, there's like not very many of them, <laughs> but thank you so much for sticking with me on this channel. I promise I will release videos on a much more regular schedule once I'm done with all this very boring, very slow work uh, of renovating a pole barn and an office. It's just, this is not what the channel is supposed to be about and I'm just one guy doing all this work so it makes it go very slow and that's my excuse, but thank you for sticking with me. I'll see you in the next video. Have a great day. Thanks for watching, bye.